Hello all, welcome to the annual Coughlin Lecture in honor of Margaret Coughlin, the first woman to receive a PhD in sociology at UVA. Guobin Yang is the Grace Lee Boggs Professor of Communication and Sociology at the Annenberg School for Communication and Department of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the director on, on the center, on the, of the Center on Digital Culture and Society, interim director of the Center for Advanced Research and Global Communication, and deputy director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. He is the author of a trilogy on contemporary China from Mao to the present, the Red Guard Generation and Political Activism in China in 2016, The Power of the Internet in China in 2009, and The Wuhan Lockdown and the Limits of Critique, the book we'll be learning about today from 2022. He is the editor or co-editor of six books, including Engaging Social Media in China, Platforms, Publics, and Production with Wei Wang 2021. What Professor Yang's bio does not mention is that he has been the leading figure in the growth of Chinese media studies in the United States and China, completing two PhDs, one in China and one in the United States. His work has inspired the growth of the field over the past 20 years, and in, in particular now during a time of great complexity in the US-China relationship. His new book, The Wuhan Lockdown and the Limits of Critique, not only provides a window into one of the most transformative periods of the COVID-19 pandemic, it offers an invaluable model for doing global research during a time of pandemic restricted travel and gives voice to those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in China. Thank you for coming to speak with us, Professor Yang, about your book, which is destined to become a classic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Anne, for your very kind and generous introduction um, and for inviting me to give the Coughlin Lecture. It's a great honor to me. And thank you everyone for uh, joining today's event. I thought I'd begin by going back to history a little bit, um, not a long way back, just 19 years. 19 years ago, in the month of April, according to New York Times, the editors of the famed journal Critical Inquiry convened the luminaries of literary theory in the University of Chicago for what they called, quote, an unprecedented meeting of the minds, an unusual two hour public symposium on the future of theory. Let me quote from the New York Times, quote, when John Kamaroff, a professor of anthropology and sociology at Chicago, who was serving as the event's moderator, turned the floor over to the panelists, for several moments, no one said a word. Then a student in the audience spoke up. What good is criticism and theory, he asked, if, quote, we concede in fact, how much more important the actions of Noam Chomsky are in the world than all the writings of critical theorists combined, end quote. The student was of course alluding to the US military invasion of Iraq, which had started less a month before. Professor Stanley Fish, who was one of the panelists and who is in the news just this week, shook his head and said, quote, I think I will let someone else answer the question. Judging from the title of the article in the New York Times, which says, the latest theory is that theory doesn't matter. The conference didn't go well. Fast forward to 2020. The world was still a turbulent world. The impeachment trial of Donald Trump was going on in late January, 2020. The US-China trade war had been dragging on for years, badly hurting the lives of people on both sides of the Pacific. And then Wuhan declared a complete shutdown starting on January 23rd due to the coronavirus. It shocked the world. The lives of tens of millions of people were unsettled 
overnight, the city of 11 million would be under strict lockdown for 76 days. Wuhan residents responded in surprising ways. They made enormous sacrifices to keep families and communities safe. They performed acts of citizenship by working as volunteers or simply by diligently following quarantine and stay at home orders. There were great fears and anxieties about the frailties of life, as well as the determination to fight the virus. All this came across clearly in the numerous lockdown diaries that were shared on social media. There was an explosion of diary writing soon after the lockdown started. Diary writing became a form of civic engagement of documenting history, managing daily life, and voicing concerns. Unfortunately, with few exceptions, these stories of Wuhan residents fighting the virus were missing in the mainstream media coverage here. For some time in 2020, the media discourse was plagued by a belligerent and militant language of China virus and Wuhan virus, incidents of anti-Asian and anti-China racism and hate surged. How might academics respond? One thing that could be done would be to tell the stories of the residents in Wuhan. The challenge was how. My inspiration came from an intellectual trend which affirms the significance of description and documentation in scholarly writing, as opposed to the practice of theoretical critique and detached analysis. Sometimes this is called a descriptive term. Sometimes it is called a post-critical term. This intellectual trend is manifest in the work of scholars from multiple academic disciplines. One of the key figures in this line of thinking is Professor Rita Felsky, whose book, The Limits of Critique, and co-edited book, Critique and Post-Critique, point to alternative styles and ethos of scholarly writing. Professor Felsky is an eminent scholar on the faculty of the University of Virginia. So it's especially appropriate for me to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work of Professor Felsky and others that has influenced my research and writing of the Wuhan lockdown. So before I start talking about the book, I'd like to highlight a few points in Professor Felsky's book, which are particularly poignant and inspiring to me. Published in 2015, The Limits of Critique is an examination of the practice of critique in literary and the cultural studies. Felsky writes that this practice has the following features, quote, a spirit of skeptical questioning or outright condemnation, an emphasis on its precarious position vis-a-vis -vis overbearing and oppressive social forces, the claim to be engaged in some kind of radical intellectual and or political work, and the assumption that whatever is not critical must therefore be uncritical, unquote. It is the reigning norm in literary and cultural studies to the extent that it has become a dogma. The results of these practices of critique is woeful. Um, quoting Professor Felsky again, it can be a regrettable arrogance of intellect where the smartest thing you can do is to see through the deep seated convictions and heartfelt attachments of others, unquote. Practitioners, practitioners of such critique 
try to dig deep down into the texts in order to expose hidden motives. Like detectives, they have, quote, a penchant for interrogating and indicting, a conviction that deceit and deception are ubiquitous and that everyone has something to hide, a commitment to hunting down criminal agents and a reliance on the language of guilt and complicity, unquote. This penchant for uncovering hidden mysteries is accompanied further by a disdain for the mundane and the everyday. Quoting Professor Felski again, via a training in specialized arts of reading, scholar critics learn to look down on empirical knowledge to disparage the staleness of the everyday life world, to call into question the natural and self-evident. It disregards other possibilities. Felski writes, quote, there are other silent desires, motives, agendas that drive acts of reading and that receive short thrift from critics scouring works of literature for every last crumb of real or imagined resistance. Works of art do not only subvert, but also convert. They do not only inform, but also transform, a transformation that is not just a matter of intellectual readjustment, but one of effective realignment as well. Although Felski writes about humanities, her insights, I think, extend to the social sciences and knowledge production more broadly. A key insight is about understanding the limits of a thought style that disparages the everyday life world in favor of high-flown theories and theoretical explanation, treating the objects of study as criminal suspects. This kind of disparaging critique leads to a quote, explanation as accusation, where accounting for the social causes of something serves as a means of downgrading it, unquote. I venture to claim that there is a similar thought style in operation in the field of China studies. China scholars, myself included, also seem to favor a style of writing that aims to dig up hidden motives, expose power, and uncover signs of dissent and resistance. We pride ourselves on uncovering a hidden logic or mechanism in the operations of state power or in the practices of resistance against power. We get a sense of this, we get a sense of this practice of explanation as accusation simply by glancing at the titles and descriptions of many books about China. Now, I have collected just a, a, a random list of uh, keywords which appear often in book titles and book descriptions such as sorrows, shadows, hidden, power, escape, true story, real story, intriguing story, unknown story, alarming findings, repression, control, statecraft, pathologies, crisis, secret strategy, and so on and so forth. In one sense, there's nothing wrong with this kind of practice and could be very valuable, but it becomes problematic when it becomes the reigning norm, as in the case of critiques studied by Professor Felski. What is the alternative to this kind of disparaging and accusatory critique? Felski proposes an approach or ethos which she calls post-critical reading. In post-critical reading, scholars turn attention to topics such as empathy and sympathy, recognition and identification, enchantment and absorption, shock and the sublime, the pleasures, and of, the pleasures of fandom and connoisseurship as they, as they shape how and why people read. 
In post-critical reading, Felsky continues, quote, rather than looking behind the text for its hidden causes, determining conditions and obnoxious motives, we might place ourselves in front of the text, reflecting on what it unfurls, calls forth, makes possible, unquote. Placing ourselves in front of the text is to let us as readers respond emotionally to the text or to take an effective stance. It is to open us up to the power of the text to cultivate a sensibility, even vulnerability toward the objects of our study. Kowski writes, quote, anyone who attends academic talks has learned to expect the inevitable question, but what about power? Perhaps it's time to start asking different questions, but what about love? Or where is your theory of attachment? How do works move us and why? So these issues about critique and theory immediately presented themselves when I started writing about the Wuhan lockdown. In the face of the struggles and sacrifices of millions of people, writing took on new meanings and different kinds of urgencies. The complexity and heaviness of the Wuhan lockdown as a historical event put an ethical demand on researchers. I think it calls for humble approaches and a sense of humility and receptivity to all the experiences of the people on the ground. The event was still unfolding and no one knew when the lockdown would be lifted. It would be too hasty to try to draw conclusions about an inconclusive event. I was writing the book in 2020 and the pandemic still ongoing now. After the, Wuhan, after the city was locked down, an explosion of texts of lockdown diaries thrust itself in front of me. Indeed, in front of all those who were following the events in Wuhan on social media. To borrow Professor Felski's language, I was compelled to put myself in front of these texts rather than to dig behind them. And in doing so, I felt their emotional power. It was moving to see that residents in Wuhan fought the virus by strictly following stay at home orders. They lived through the most uncertain period of the COVID-19 crisis and the harshest experiences of lockdown with a silent courage. They suffered more than many others physically and psychologically because they were among the first to be exposed to this novel virus. They had no other people to learn from. Yet they accepted the new routine of home quarantine with resignation and grace. They harbored a sense of humility toward life. But as I mentioned earlier, their stories were largely missing in mainstream media coverage here. So the pressing question for me in writing the book was not about how to theorize their experiences, but how to bring their voices and stories, hopefully, to public discourse, to the public realm. Wuhan residents were themselves remarkably aware of the importance of telling their own stories. And that's why they wrote so many diaries. And these diaries became the main material uh, for my effort to tell their stories. So uh, let me now turn to the book and say a few words about how I exactly how I try to tell the stories. And I'll also share a couple of stories from the book. My main strategy was to focus on scenes and characters. Uh, scenes as in dramatic scenes and characters as in, you know, fictional characters. The book follows a roughly chronological order, starting from the beginning of the lockdown and ending with the end of the lockdown on April the 8th. The chapters are structured by theme. Um, so for instance, uh, chapter three is called People's War. So it was about uh, government policies uh, 
uh, on COVID and, and citizens' responses to these policies. Chapter four is about lockdown diaries. It's called lockdown diaries. Chapter six is, is called civic organizing. It's about citizens organizing, um, you know, to support uh, Wuhan. And, and so these are uh, how, how the chapters are organized, uh, nine chapters all together. Each chapter presents a series of dramatic scenes and characters. So why do I focus on scenes and characters? In a way, um, I didn't actually initially choose it. It was forced upon me. You know, it was hard to avoid because the lockdown was a period of high drama and scenes and characters just thrust themselves in public via social media on a daily basis. Anyone who, who was following what was happening in Wuhan at the time uh, would remember many of these scenes and the characters, uh, it's just hard to miss. The concept of scene, obviously is borrowed from drama, but it's used by scholars in various fields. Sociologists, uh, for example, view scenes as processes rather than as stable contexts. Scenes are never final, but always coming and going. They're fleeting and unpredictable. So in that sense, scenes, the, the scenes I described one after another in one chapter after another, convey a sense of the flux and uncertainties of life under lockdown. They also reveal the texture of everyday life in particularly concrete ways. Characters. The book recounts the stories of numerous characters. The lockdown tests the lives of tens of millions of people, 11, a city of 11 million. And one of my goals was to try to recreate the galaxy of characters in Wuhan. Stories of people from all walks of life, healthcare workers, patients, diarists, volunteers, poets, writers, delivery drivers, retirees, retired teachers, and so on. And what were their stories about? Also a broad range. There were stories of sacrifice, bravery, resilience, but also stories of fear, anxiety, pain, hardship, family and love, and a sense of the limits of life. So let me give an example of a scene and its characters. Anie is one of the characters in chapter five. Chapter five is entitled Fire and Thunder. It is about the stories of patients and healthcare workers. Anie was a COVID patient who was initially placed in a temporary shelter hospital because she had light symptoms. Light, you know, patients with light symptoms were placed in temporary shelter hospitals. But later on, she asked to be transferred to the Thunder God Mountain Hospital, which was a hospital for patients with severe symptoms. And she asked to be transferred there because her grandmother, 87 year old grandmother was hospitalized there also for COVID. Her story takes up several pages in the book. Um, let me read a few paragraphs actually, which describe her and her father's reactions when they found out they tested post positive uh, for COVID. So this is on page 97 and 98, um, a little over a page, um, if you can bear with me. So this because this is a, I think is a uh, just example of a scene and characters that I describe in the book. On February 11, 2020, seeing that grandma was not getting better, Anya's parents took her to a hospital. Took her grandma to a hospital. Left alone at home, Anya could not sleep. At around two or three a.m. Her father called from the hospital and told her that her grandmother had probably gotten infected. So he was coming back home to pick up Anya for a test. Standing in the middle of the living room, Anya thought to herself, quote, this is from her diary. 
if our whole family are infected with this disease, with this disease and die one after another, then this home will become completely empty. Can I come back after today's testing? What will happen to our pets if bad things happen to us? Will they also get sick? Anya and her father took COVID tests that morning. Two days later, they checked the results online via their phones. Her father's result was negative. She made a screenshot of her own result and shared it in her family's WeChat group. See, I'm negative too, she wrote. After looking at her screenshot closely though, her father said, how come you are positive? She saw her result was indeed positive. Her father looked at his phone and then at her. Quoting from Anian's diary, his eyes were full of such fear and pain as I had never seen before. Then he began, began to murmur to himself, how can you be positive? How can you be positive? Unquote. Shortly afterwards, she received a phone call from a community staff member. The community office had received the notification of her diagnosis and asked her to get ready to move to a shelter hospital. Anya saw her father's reaction. Again, quote, quoting from her diary. Dad stood with his back facing me, his two hands pressing down on the table. This abrupt news of pain and sadness seemed to have sucked all the energy out of him. He would probably have collapsed if he were not holding onto the table. Anya had never seen her father so broken. Community workers soon arrived and drove her to a shelter hospital called Wuhan Lounge. The next day, Anya started posting diaries on Sina Weibo and, and vlogs on Douyin, video blogs on Douyin. Her Weibo postings were mostly short, some as brief as one phrase or one sentence, but their brevity conveyed a special urgency and force. Her first posting on Weibo starts with shelter hospital diary day one. Valentine's Day. My residential community sent a police car to take me to the shelter hospital. I'll try to be the most optimistic girl in the hospital. Her second posting on Weibo put up on the same day goes shelter hospital diary. The patient in, in se number 72 bed suddenly burst into loud howling with her hands reaching forward. She was not speaking clearly and was trembling. My heart sank. I hurried to the help desk to get a nurse. I thought she must be suffering badly from the disease, but it turned out it was because of her personal relationships. Anya posted every day on Weibo, day four. Yesterday I was crying. Today I'm smiling. Life is just as capricious as this. Another posting on day four. Everyone says one must be strong. Why doesn't anyone teach you how to be strong? So her story goes on for several pages, uh, but I just wanted to show this as an example of the kind of scenes and characters I presented in the book. But for Anya in this story here, it was probably the first time that she thought of death and she was 26 year, 26 year old. Uh, at that time, but it was the first time probably she thought of death and the frailty of life. Her story and the stories of many others conveys a new awareness of the limits of life, as well as a deep love of it. How to write a book about the limits of life without mulling over the limits of critique or the limits of academic writing? I thought the most I could do would be to try to tell their stories and not to try to theorize or dissect because to dissect sometimes is to kill the vitality of life. But the telling of individual stories surely has a broader social significance. Anian describes her experience and emotions in great detail in her, in her diaries. They were very personal but they were also social in the sense that her story reveals a lot 
about the emotional ups and downs of many individuals and families during the Wuhan lockdown. There are many others who wrote about this kind of uh, very strong emotional reactions um, to the people who, who got sick uh, around, around them. In literary studies, there was a conventional taboo on treating characters as if they were real. However, in their 2019 book entitled Character Three Inquiries in Literary Studies, Anderson, Felsky, and Moy argue for the possibility of minimizing the fictionality of character by treating imaginary and real persons as if they were more or less the same. They wrote the following in the book, quote, perhaps it's the fictional qualities of characters that make them real. Figures in novels and films are alluring, arresting, alive, not in spite of their aesthetic dimensions, but because of them. That they are fictional does not mean they are stuck fast in the works where they first appear. Characters are often translated and adapted, teleporting into new media and media. Reversing, the, reversing these questions, I try to ask the, ask the following question of the characters in Wuhan. Given that these are real life persons, in what ways can we view them as fictional characters? What do we gain by viewing them as fictional characters? I think one advantage of focusing on characters in, this, in the book rather than on plot is that it is less likely to produce a linear teleological story. One of the critiques of narratives is that because narrative tends to focus on the implotment of events, it imposes an order on otherwise fluid and messy events. As I mentioned earlier, the book follows only a roughly chronological order. The period of the lockdown 76 day duration had its upside, ups and downs and reversals. It was not a linear story. More importantly for my purposes, although my stories of the characters in Wuhan are portraits of real persons, at least to some extent, they are fictionalized and dramatized. It is through social media that they gained public attention. Once their stories were shared on social media, they became public figures. Social media users talked about them, tweeted and retweeted stories about them as if they were characters in an ongoing drama. In this process, certain aspects of their stories are highlighted or dramatized. So let me give you another example. And this is, this is the longest example. And it's about the story of Dr. Li Wenliang. It's a well-known story of the Wuhan lockdown period. After Dr. Li died on February the 7th, 2020, internet users wrote obituaries by summarizing the contents of his Weibo postings. These stories presented Dr. Li as a lovable guy with a sense of humor and a kind heart, a very down-to-earth person, a very ordinary person is, is, the, is the kind of language that people use, a lot of people use, a very ordinary person. So here's one such story, which I quoted uh, in my book. This is just, uh, I'll just read one paragraph from page 197. One of the obituaries uh, circulating online at the time, uh, an excerpt from it. Li Wenliang was born in the 80s. He loved fried chicken, hot pot, and Japanese sushi. He liked posting food photos on Weibo, but some of them were quite ugly. He used to play badminton, but gained weight in recent years. Even my dad's figure is better than mine, Li wrote on Weibo. Once, he wanted to eat oranges, so he ran his slippers in rain to buy them. In 2013, after the Ya and earthquakes, he made two monetary donations via WeChat. One day, he went shopping after work 
and saw cherries costing 150 yuan per gin. It's a little over one pound. He took a photo of it and posted on Weibo with the comment, can't afford. So this is the kind of stories about Dr. Lee that were circulating on Weibo. So was this the real Dr. Lee? Sure, you know, it was the real Dr. Lee, but was there also an element of fictionalization? I think there's no doubt about that either because the person who wrote the obituary called Dr. Lee's Weibo postings and constructed a narrative out of them. It was in this process of narration and dramatization that Dr. Lee was turned into a national hero. There seemed to be an unspoken effort on social media to immortalize him by talking about him and even talking to him. This was how Dr. Lee's Weibo account became the waiting wall of the Chinese internet. So this is the, the, the language used by social, social media users. They call Dr. Lee's uh, Weibo timeline, uh, the waiting wall of the Chinese internet. Why? Because every day since Dr. Lee's death in February, 2020, users have, have been visiting his Weibo and leaving comments for him without end. They will be telling him recent news about the COVID situation, but also confiding, confiding in him about very personal matters. So I quoted a few such comment, uh, comments in the book. Uh, and I read a few. Uh, these are user comments left on his, on his timeline, Weibo timeline. I haven't been with my girlfriend for three months. She's in Shanghai. When, when user wrote, I'm in Beijing, air tickets are very cheap, but I don't know when this is going to end and things can return, uh, and, and things can return to no, normal. This was in 2020. Another user wrote, Dr. Li, I have good news. Junior and high, senior high schools in Guangxi will start the semester on April the 7th. Another user wrote, I miss my dad. He has died for almost 20 years. So all these, all kinds of comments like this, um, just, you know, users keep posting there uh, ever since then. There are you know, uh, millions of them now. I've checked, I checked this morning. And, you know, even, even as I was checking, you will see, you know, you, if I refresh my browser, you see new comments there. So I, I, I have a few quotes from this morning. Dr. Lee, when, when you wrote, I've come here to see you. Another one wrote, Dr. Lee, there's so much pressure. I hope my income this year will not be too bad. Another one wrote, Dr. Lee, life is really hard this year. Because of the pandemic, we'll start our school holiday early. Dr. Lee, is there a way out? Can we cut down to zero COVID case in a short time and prevent a rebound? So the legend of Dr. Lee goes on and on uh, like this has literally become a virtual conversation partner for millions of people. His story keeps calling forth the emotions of numerous readers. If he is immortalized in these virtual conversations, which are really a form of personal storytelling, multiple personal storytelling, can we say that the limits of life are for once transcended through storytelling, can the limits of critique also be transcended through storytelling? Or perhaps the question is not about transcendence, but about an awareness of limits. One thing I learned from the stories of the Wuhan lockdown is that Wuhan residents were keenly aware of the vulnerabilities and limits of life. From that awareness, issue their deep uh, humility toward life, their love of life, and their acts of citizenship in fighting and enduring the COVID crisis. An awareness of the limits of life is associated with the ethics of life. In the same way, by enhancing our awareness of the limits of critique, the work of Professor Felsky and many others 
also opens up the possibility of a new ethics, not only of read an ethics of reading literary text, texts, but also an ethics of academic writing and knowledge production more broadly. Thank you. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Professor Young. Um, that was really, really touching, especially to hear the, the, the discussions that are already continue, that are continuing even to this day on, professor, uh, on Dr. Dr. Lee's Weibo account. So at this point, I will open question and answer. So please feel free to put your Q&A in the chat or on the Q&A button. Um, and, I have as, um, and I have a couple of questions that I'd love to start off with. So just first thinking about this, this challenge of the limits of critique and of the fictionalized narratives, uh, the narratives that we see online, this kind of balance between the very heartfelt postings that we could read about and the performativity of social media. How, as a scholar, telling these stories, do you balance between the when you're telling these stories? And how do you how did you think about that as you were situating them? And, and this kind of touches on a broader question that we were discussing earlier about how we can think about this as a, as a new method for doing research, quote unquote, in China or about China when there are these major geographic barriers. Thank you, thank you, Anne. That's a that's a very important question, um, and uh, not sure how how much detail I can go into it uh, because there I think there are there there's so many things involved here. Um, you know the question of uh, using online uh, lockdown diaries diaries as the primary material for telling the stories of Wuhan. Um, yeah, raises the kind of questions that you you hinted at. You know, the performativity of the online diaries. After all, these are are very different from the conventional kind of diary writing, which you know, you know, typically people wrote for themselves. Although, it's not often the case. There are also people who wrote diaries uh, with uh, publication uh, in mind, with with some kind of audience imagined a real audience in mind, but still online lockdown diaries are very different. Um, so to what extent can we, uh, and of course, I we haven't got a chance to talk about um, uh, the kind of ecology of cyberspace in China that uh, that is a lot of censorship. I have one chapter on censorship in the book. Um, uh, and therefore, when people post uh, diaries, anything else, you know, social media postings could be censored. And in order to avoid censorship, um, the users will be very cautious and careful in phrasing, uh, in how to, you know, phrase their language. Um, so does that uh, compromise, let's say, the authenticity of the diaries. Um, so my my uh, my response would be, um, you know, again, this might take a take a long response, but a rel in, in a relatively short kind of response, to make a long story short, uh, we need to understand these texts as appearing in that particular. Uh, social, cultural, technological environment. I think for scholars uh, who study China, especially Chinese cyberspace, they would understand uh, that that's the context and that's important. Um, but then secondly, I would also say that, you know, surely we will be, uh, because, because in, in postings, uh, lockdown diaries on social media involve some kind of uh, not only considerations of censorship, but also are always, it's a form of self-presentation, right? Self-presentation, because we, there are always audience, uh, all kinds of audience, imagined real, 
friends and strangers. Um, so when people post this, um, I think they we, we should also understand as readers, uh, understand that's, that's, that's part of the culture of social media, right? It happens here. And um, how, how, would, how, how are people likely to say things that they may not want to say? That's again, a question that doesn't worry me that much because we know again, from our understanding of the culture of social media, nowadays we on social media, we post things then we, we probably didn't even write about in our diaries, private diaries uh, before. So, it, so uh, uh, I think, uh, I guess the point is that we need to understand that particular cultural, technological and political context for posting these diaries. But at the same time, um, I still feel that these, these texts are uh, really you know, con contain rich, um, expressions of personal emotions and feelings and views that uh, I, I wouldn't want to use the language of authenticity to, to, to talk about this kind of material, but I'm not worried about authentic, authenticity either. I think it's the best material available, um, at least from, this, from a distance uh, that I, I could get hold of to tell the stories of uh, people in Wuhan. Thank you. No, I think that it's it's really a, a pioneering approach to and a way to address a challenge that I think our field will will increasingly face. Even even if, you know as the zero as the zero COVID strategy continues in China, um, or even as just travel between the two countries becomes more difficult for a variety of other reasons, or as as research becomes more challenging, as we saw um, there were some presenters who were presenting in China for the Association for Asian Studies who um, had police visit them shortly after their, their presentation. So just the atmosphere for research between the two countries has also become so much more complex. So I, I really, as a scholar in this field, I really appreciate the ground that you were breaking with writing this book. I have a, thank I have you. a oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> I have a question from Sylvia, from Professor Sylvia Chong from the English department and the American Studies department. Um, she writes, Professor Yang, thank you for your thought provoking talk. As a US based film and media researcher, I know that one of the first questions we asked about online discourse is about monetization, transforming affective or emotional, emotional labor of self narration into income streams or quote unquote branding as influencers. Are these elements present in PRC internet usage or does the presence of government censors interrupt that symbiotic and literary economy? I think, you know, the, um, again, the, the kind of uh, ecology of social media in China, in many ways are, uh, are very similar to the US. You know, there are a lot of similarity. There is a culture of the influencers, you know, in China is the language is called Wang Hong, online celebrities. Um, you can uh, post uh, a video of you sleeping or eating eating a meal and get viral and make money out of it. Uh, and you can you know you can sell vegetables you grow, uh, like rural villages. So uh, there is certainly an um, um, economic uh, story to it. E-commerce is big, and the government is very uh, supportive of um, of e-commerce. Um, entrepreneurs. Um, but at the same time, there is also, I think this is a long uh, history and history of the culture of the internet from the very beginning. I've been following the internet uh, development uh, almost from the very beginning. And I see that from, from very early days, there has uh, developed this uh, culture of uh, very active public engagement in, in discourse, public discourse, public discussions. Um, and, uh, you know, many, many important influential cases in which um, through this kind of uh, public engagement, um, you know, social media users can expose corruption, government efficiencies, government policies, and so on. So, uh, again, I'm not sure this is the best answer, but uh, very briefly, 
a broad range of uh, activities in Chinese uh, social media space. A um, lot of it uh, has to do with, um, there's an economic story to it. Um, there is also a political story to it, right? The, the censorship governance uh, management part of the story. But uh, the story of internet culture and cultural ex expression from the bottom up, I think, um, is particularly fascinating and has been very important uh, for decades. Uh, but explosion of this kind of personal writing, online diaries, but also other forms of on, uh, on personal writing, photography, poems, and the sudden explosion during the Wuhan lockdown was still quite amazing because uh, the censorship didn't uh, um, uh, disappear, you know. Um, but so it was still quite uh, quite amazing. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question here from um, Yi Jing Shen, who is a, um, an undergraduate student here at UVA. Um, after receiving the negative feed at, at UVA and at Waseda University, actually. So she, um, she's an exchange student here from Japan as well. Um, so very transnational background. Um, after receiving the negative feedback from the implementation of quote unquote gratitude education in Wuhan, how do you see the government grappling with gratitude politics in the future? How does large scale negative public opinion influence the ways the government adopts and changes policies? Thank you for that uh, question. So I, I do have uh, the last section of chapter three is called gratitude politics. Um, so, it, it, so that there's an episode, a, a story there about, uh, about the Wuhan mayor. Um, encouraging its residents to, to show gratitude to the party and the party chairman uh, for what they've been doing for the people of Wuhan. But of course, it immediately backfired and it didn't work. Um, and uh, the, the newspaper which published the story, of course, it a, was a print story, but it was also posted on its uh, social media account, uh, actually deleted. So it's kind of self-censorship, but it's under the pressure of the public, um, it's backfired. And then very soon, uh, the president himself, Xi Jinping visited in Wuhan, sort of basically acknowledged that, um, you know, we are grateful to the people of Wuhan, right? Um, it's it's, it's an acknowledgement really of that kind of um, uh, citizens criticism of the, of the mayor's um, gratitude politics. So the question about, you know, what will happen to this kind of gratitude politics in the future um, is difficult to to uh, to answer. You know, in a sense that uh, I think everywhere is difficult to see into the future. Um, I think um, um, one thing about this because this has a lot to do with internet, uh, the cyber culture, cyber politics in China. And uh, if we, we, we try to kind of make an argument based on our understanding of what has, happened, what has been happening in cyberspace, then I might, uh, I might venture to say that, you know, it could happen again, you know, um, in the sense that uh, there have been per 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 periodically tightening of, of, uh, of uh, censorship of the internet, um, but, uh, you never know when there'll be an outburst, an explosion of, of public expression like the kind we saw during the lockdown period. And I think this kind of contingency um, is always there. Um, so I, I thought I'd try to point to this kind of possibility, openness, contingency um, in, the, in the final concluding chapter where I talk about the sense of active citizenship. There is this kind of, um, Again, you know, it has a lot to do with how people have been using the internet. There is just people are just so much engaged in what's there, and then they'll be they'll they'll talk about things, and and it's all, nowadays it's uh, it's common practice to cross to you know cross platform uh, usage. You know, you would post your message on multiple platforms. You know, the diary writers, a lot of them post posted their diaries on both WeChat and on Weibo as a way of. Uh, trying to uh, navigate the, the landscape of uh, censorship. So, in, so what, I guess what I'm saying is that, um, uh, you know, 
it's possible. Uh, there's always that uh, that sense of agency, I think, we see among the citizens. Thank you. Well, um, and just as a reminder to our participants in the webinar, you can add questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so I have a question here from Nancy Damon, a community member. Um, her question is, how has volunteerism changed in the last few years, either due to earthquakes, the pandemic, et cetera? Thank you for that question. So chapter six um, is about, it's about volunteering and civic organizing. It's called civic organizing. And in that chapter, I mainly try to tell stories of uh, volunteers and civic organizing during the lockdown period. But um, in the in the later part of the chapter, I try to make some comparisons with uh, civic organizing and volunteering after the Sichuan earthquakes in 2008. Uh, so uh, I guess if I just try to uh, recall a few of the points I made there, there will be a, a response to your questions. Um, so 2008, uh, according you know, to Chinese NGO practitioners, as well as scholars of uh, anthropologists, sociologists uh, uh, in 2008 and 2009, in that, in that period was exhil exhilarated about NGO development. Uh, why? Because after the earthquakes in May um, 2008, NGOs uh, from all over the country poured into Chengdu to provide um, disaster relief to the extent that there are so many that they had problems of coordination. Eventually, they build a kind of coalition in order to coordinate their activities um, well. And there was a lot of media coverage about this kind of stories, and they were also all very proud of what they were doing. In other words, there was a very uh, strong um, um, NGO culture. NGO was a good thing. A main, a main major change uh, in the in the Wuhan lockdown period, and this kind of changes uh, have been happening over the past ten years also, and I tried to um, provide a sketch of these changes in chapter two. But, you know, in one ma major difference during Wuhan lockdown was, um, well, there are still uh, NGOs um, involved in uh, civic organizing during the Wuhan lockdown, but they, uh, they hardly ever call themselves NGOs. NGO as, as the concept, the terminology, as well as civil society, have lost their legitimacy in this period of the retreat of civil society in China. So they would rather call themselves grassroots organizations, social organizations. So that's one thing. Secondly, not that many of them, at least not in high profile. There are a few high profile, for instance, there's one uh, organization which organized um, uh, volunteers to do um, counseling. Um, that's in the, in, there were, there were reports about NGO, uh, the grassroots organization activity during this period. Uh, and with the language, the new language was, uh, was uh, social organization and government partnership, uh, government uh, organization partnership. That's, that's one thing, so uh, less important. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of the civil organizing during the Wuhan lockdown um, happened uh, through the work of online groups or individuals, online in, especially online fandom groups. And those of you who, again, follow Chinese uh, web culture know that online fandom groups are powerful organizations, but they are, they are organizations, you know, informal online organizations, not organized for any political purposes, but basically to, 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 to promote their own idols. And they often also engaged in fights with their rival, rival uh, groups. So, but they are, they're very well organized. So in the early days of the lockdown, when the, the local Red Cross Society uh, didn't prove to be very efficient in, in raising money and uh, providing donations, these online fandom groups proved to be extremely efficient. They raised money in no time and they were able to deliver the donations that they, they, they purchased very quickly to Wuhan. 
And then also individuals were also active as organizers in this time. So the beginning of the chapter, the, the chapter six uh, civic organizing opens with the story of a young woman who, uh, who was a pet lover. And she, she found out you know, soon after lockdown that you know, a lot of there were abandoned pet, uh, pets uh, uh, in Wuhan. So she started the WeChat group to try to provide, to just organize volunteers to provide um, um, kind of animal rescue uh, to these abandoned pets. Very, just within one day, um, she, she was able to organize, you know, a several, I think five or six WeChat groups, each with about four, five, uh, 500 members to cover different districts in Wuhan. Very efficient uh, kind of work. Um, of course, we also know there are feminist groups uh, which organized um, online uh, activities, anti-domestic violence campaign, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's these are some of the main changes that have taken place uh, over the, I think, oh, if we compare 2008 and uh, 2020, these are some of the major changes. It, you know, WeChat was very important for individual organizing, informal organizing uh, in, in the lockdown period. And plus, of course, in 2009, 2008, internet was important also for fundraising. Jet Li used uh, uh, on, uh, online community Tianya at the time raised, raised a lot of money also very quickly, but the number of internet users at that time was much smaller compared now. Now it's over 70% of the entire population. Oh, 1 billion people, I think. Over 1 billion people are now online. So there is that digital infrastructure and that fa facilitates uh, organizing of all kinds. You know, I also talk about how this kind of WeChat uh, and WeChat group groups became indispensable for daily grocery shopping. And then recently we see stories from Shanghai or from Changchun, I think, especially where uh, seniors, uh, senior citizens who are not very good at using WeChat had trouble getting their, getting their groceries during their lockdown. The, the number of, the rich number of stories that, that you're able to share as you answer these questions, I think just speaks to the richness of the book. and. For those of you who haven't had a chance to, to pick it up and read it, I would just urge you to, to, to get a copy of the, of the book because this is just a very small portion of the really rich, um, rich storytelling and, and rich texture that we get about this kind of challenging moment in time, um, in addition to a better understanding of the, the landscape of social media. Um, now, building on that, I have a question from Yingyao Wang, um, who as, who says, everywhere we turn around the world, we tend to see politically tinted personal st storytelling in social media form. This has a lot to do with political polarization, which is also feudalizing public forums and social media. I'm intrigued by the phenomena that space of personal narratives is relatively purified and well protected, if you will, in China. You mentioned the possibility of resignation to the frailty of life in the wake of big events like this. In your reading of the texts, do you also see any conversations or tensions between the recognition of structural factors, which are beyond ind individual's reach and personal life experiences? Um, thank you, uh, Yinya, for that question. Um, so first of all, um, I should say that, um, well, this, the stories I presented, I only presented a couple of, the, of many of the stories in the book. Um, um, I think the, the social media discourse and the broad, uh, broader kind of ecology uh, has some differences from here. Uh, you know, here we all know it's so polarized, but it doesn't mean there is no polarization in Chinese cyberspace and during the Wuhan lockdown especially, and that's the period of uh, interest to me. Um, but if, if we recall, uh, uh, that 76 days uh, is actually there were there were gradual changes and here we will uh, bring in the story of Fang Fang because Fang Fang uh, again some of you may know is a well-known novelist in China uh, but still many people probably didn't know her work until the lockdown and that's because she began to post uh, her own diaries um, on WeChat and on Weibo and she was censored uh, for some time, but you know, um, with the help of uh, her friends, uh, 
she was still able to post her diaries until the end of her writing. She, she, she wrote 60, 60 entries. I think she stopped writing late March. For much of this period, her diaries, all, you know, reading her diaries almost became kind of social ritual for millions of, of social media users. She usually posted her diaries at night, around midnight, even later. And a lot of other people who also wrote, you know, wrote diaries would be, would be saying things like, I'm waiting for Fang Fang to post her diaries so, I, so that I can read it. The first thing when it was posted, of course, that's because they worry that as soon as they were posted, they would disappear. Um, um, but it became also a, a, a social a, a ritual in a sense. Some people even say, I can't go to sleep. I can't sleep without reading her diary today. I have to wait for her diary for her to post her diary. And the reason was because she did articulate the kind of anxieties, sentiments uh, during that period. And in many ways, provide a kind of emotional catharsis uh, for the people under stress, under that kind of emotional stress. Um, so, uh, you know, on Weibo and on WeChat, uh, you, you might even say all kinds of online diary communities formed. Not just her diary, she was only one of many, although she had a large, large number of followers, bigger, num bigger uh, following than others. But many other diarists, um, I also wrote about you know, the diverse range of diaries. They also had you know, bigger or smaller followings, and then there will be kind of online communities following them. Um, so the story here, the, this is uh, where we, we can bring the polarization story. In, in late March, just at the time when she was about to end her diary, she, she wrote 60. 60 is the lucky number, you know. You end on 60, that's a good lucky number. But just around that time, um, people, uh, people read news that uh, her diary was going to be published in English and in German. And, uh, and then some, uh, and then she began to attract, she, she always had kind of critics, of course, but then she began to attract uh, a lot of criticisms and trolls, attacks and so on. And the, the main claim was that, um, and again, recall, well, the kind of the media landscape here, the media discourse, the kind of Wuhan virus, China virus, there were even um, calls for reparations from China, right? So a lot of uh, US-China rivalry uh, in this, this kind of discourse. And therefore, uh, the kind of criticism she was receiving at the time was that, well, by making her diary available in English, this and because her diary exposed a lot of the problems during lockdown, this was like uh, like handing. This is the language that was often used: handing a mu ammunition to to the critics, uh, to the foreign critics of China. Uh, so polarization, you know, started. People began to take sides. You have to be for Fang Fang or against Fang Fang. Um, it, you know, on WeChat as well, we know that even among friends, maybe even family members, uh, people began to be divided because of their different positions as vis-a-vis -vis Fang Fang's diary. So there's that polarization um, as well. So that's a long answer to, uh, to the first part of your question. Uh, uh, yeah. The second part of the question, uh, you know, um, it's important. Um, of course, these are personal stories and uh, people wrote about their personal experiences, daily lives, meals, um, what I eat and, you know, mood, their moods, ruminations and so on. A lot of these are personal individual, but uh, there are a lot of criticisms, uh, you know, really showing understanding of structural issues, of structural and institutional problems, of course. Fang Fang, again, Fang Fang, uh, one of the main reasons that, uh, again, she was attacked was because she kept calling for um, government accountability uh, for the, in, you know, in, uh, ineffective implementation and delayed uh, information, whatever. So that's, that kind of uh, um, criticisms uh, resonated with a lot of people. So there is uh, uh, understand, you know, this is um, 
this is the common understanding, I would say, among Chinese uh, uh, citizens about, about all these kind of institutional problems. And it's only in this period, this, these problems just became uh, exacerbated and became more exposed than, than, than before. Um, so, uh, you know, so this is a really good question. And, and, and my, my, my brief response is that, yes, uh, a lot of criticisms of the uh, institutional problems, of various, as various aspects of institutional. And one of the, another key, uh, key criticism is uh, criticism of a bureau bureaucratic formalism, xing shi zhu yi, right? Um, which has been, uh, you know, ever, ever since Mao's time, Mao himself criticized, realized that formalism, xing shi zhu yi, was a serious problem, problem within the, you know, bureaucracy. But then it could just, uh, it just uh, can't be, um, can't be resolved. So uh, there, there was a lot of um, Could you define formalism for some of our audience? Thank you. Formalism is, uh, I, I use another term, the politics of appearance. So government agencies, uh, let's say environmental protection, well, not necessarily environmental protection, local, local government authorities sometimes in order to make, make, in order to show that they have a good environment, they would paint, paint uh, the hill uh, in green, just so that travelers or you know, leaders who are inspecting would think, wow, this is very nice green hills, but actually it's painted, it's false. So that's, that's called formalism. It's, a, it's kind of politics of appearance. And there's one story in chapter three, uh, as a protest event, which is specifically about this. So it's called fake and fake. And I, I'll just briefly summarize that story. I think we have a little bit of time. Now, the top leader on the ground was Vice Premier Sun Chunlan, who was dispatched from Beijing to Wuhan to lead the war on COVID. One day, she was leading an inspection of leaders, local leaders in the residential community. And then just from this high rise buildings came out shouts of fake and fake and formalism. And, and then the complaints was that the community residential community uh, committee Knowing that, knowing that there will be party leaders coming for inspection, that morning arranged to deliver free groceries to the residents, so that the residents will, will can say, you know, yeah, our our resident committees have been very helpful and you know, are providing deliver you know free free grocery deliveries. But when Vice Premier Sun Quan was was touring this this place. The residents just shouted and, and said, that's fake. That's just prearranged. It's not, not you know, we, we, have, we have been having uh, grocery, the grocery problems for a while and then and they, were just, they were just pretending to be doing a good job. So that's called formalism. I, I'm, I'm not sure this is the best translation, but that's the translation that's often used. Uh, but the, the idea is really just uh, uh, appearance for appearance sake and sometimes just, uh, uh, the real um, result is very bad. All right, so we have, um, we have a question from Zheng Wang um, who writes, Dr. Yang, thank you for your good presentation. After the publication of your book, I am wondering whether there are reports and discussions on your book in Chinese media. I know the COVID-19 related issues and writings have become very sensitive in China. I'm wondering whether you feel under pressure for writing and publishing such a book. Can Chinese readers accept objective research on the Wuhan lockdown? No, I haven't seen any uh, public media responses to my book. Uh, well, probably because it doesn't have a Chinese translation yet. Um, I do have um, personal friends who really wanted to read the book, um, but I don't think they can get it from Amazon because I don't think Chinese Amazon you can get the book. Um, uh, so I haven't received any invitations to translate the book into Chinese. I um, I do have a, uh, there is this one um, talk scheduled um, in May. Uh, 
I think mainly for for the Chinese audience. Uh, so yeah, the, I, you know, the question is, uh, I I I don't have uh, any response yet, and um, um, I think uh, you know it has to do with uh, I don't have a the, the, you know I don't have a Chinese translation uh, at this point. Thank you. Um, and as as we've been discussing throughout the course of today and in other talks at the East Asia Center, the environment for doing transnational research between the United States and China has become increasingly complex. Um, so it's a so we appreciate you speaking with us about these challenging topics um, and feel very grateful to have this open forum for discussion. Uh, so um, a question from Megan Mathis, a student at the college. Um, with the recent events of Shanghai going into a strict lockdown, do you think the example of the Wuhan lockdown um, and what you and the work that you do in your book with citizen stories can act as examples for how to better take the effects of such restrictions on human rights, needs, and mental health into account? Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's a that's an important question, and uh, I've been thinking about this too. You know, from uh, the most recent of uh, Shanghai, but earlier Xi'an lockdown. Um, and is, especially after Xi'an lockdown, I was wondering is, uh, in, the, in the first few days, uh, not, not much diary writing, but later on more diary writing. In Shanghai, um, more, we see more. Uh, I mean, it's almost like the same drama was repeated again in Shanghai. And uh, uh, we see the same kind of cries for help uh, on Weibo and individuals will be using Weibo to compile, collect uh, uh, cries out for help and then uh, volunteers can, can contribute whatever help they, they, could, they could. And a lot, of this a lot of this is about hospital beds or about grocery, which uh, they were exactly the same things that happened in Wuhan. Um, so I don't know what to make of this, you know, uh, one can say in one sense that people never learn, um, but that's not true either. We, we do, we do learn lessons and um, um, I, I think it's, uh, um, you know, um, it's a different kind, there's one critical, dis, uh, critical difference and I may be wrong, this is my, this is my own um, effort to try to make sense of this. During the Wuhan lockdown, people didn't complain. I mean, there were small pockets of resistance and I wrote about that kind of resistance in the book as well, against quarantine or stay at home orders. People, but in general, people were, they didn't complain. They only complained when they were not enforced effectively enough. And um, that's because Wuhan was the first city ever to be locked down in the world and such a large scale and so many uncertainties. So I think uh, there was a lot of understanding among the residents that uh, we got to do uh, whatever we could. Um, and the government, they, they really counted on the government to do whatever the government could do to, to help, um, to help um, residents. Um, one difference in, in, in the Shanghai case was that uh, after two years, um, people began to realize, you know, um, the virus has uh, migrated, right? There is all different kinds of variants. Uh, the disease itself has, uh, uh, you know, it's already quite different from then. And uh, there are also a lot more discussions about the effectiveness of uh, uh, absolute uh, co zero COVID policy, right? very strict lockdown, as strict, almost as strict as the Wuhan period. Was that necessary? I think a lot of, a lot of the complaints and resent, resentment ca came out of this. And, uh, and, you know, after two years, people realized, and, you know, people are looking at data from around the world, Hong Kong more recently, that, uh, you know, um, it's a different situation now. There's, there are vaccines, although of course there's still a large population in China who are not, uh, who are not vaccinated. There, there is also medication becoming available more and more. So I think there are uh, this kind of resentment about whether 
whether the strict lockdown policies may be doing more harm than the virus itself. That's a question in a lot of people's minds. And I think that's a source of uh, resentment complaint. Don't know whether that uh, response or answers your question well. Thank you. Um, so I have two quick questions to close things out. Um, the one is critical auntie studies. Um, how, <laughs> how did this become part of the book? <laughs> and, um, so that was, that's, um, I think it was, it, so it's a really helpful way to think about these kind of um, the limits of critique or other forms of critique um, that we might be able to bring in. Um, and then the second question, and take either of these, I know we have a limited amount of time. Um, as, a, as a researcher, you were also going through all of this um, at the same time. You have um, family in China. This is an intense project. You wrote it quite quickly, given the fact that this was subject matter from 2022 or from 2020. It's, um, the book came out in early 2022. How did you, how did you navigate your your life as a as a scholar and a researcher while writing this big project during such a such a difficult time. Um, thank you, Anne, for for that question. Um, again, this is uh, a topic that we can talk for for a long time. I you know a lot of personal experiences to share. But first of all, about the critical anti studies idea. Um, um, I learned, I learned it from one of my students about the conference, which was uh, just organized the, the, at the time I was writing the, the book and um, it's called Critical Anti Studies um, uh, by scholars of performance studies. So I thought, well, that captures very well what I, I was writing about those stories. And uh, I also wrote in the chapter on civic organizing that women played a particularly prominent role in the lockdown period, uh, in, in various kinds of roles, you know, as, as organizers, as volunteers, counselors, um, protesters, right, the protest, the, the several major cases of protest in chapter three on the People's Walk, like including the fake and fake, but also there is the uh, Wuhan swearing auntie. Uh, there were stories of um, fearless women, um, in that period, you know, so um, you know, always lucky to have a to have a student who knows a lot of things. And then um, I was teaching a class on performance uh, society, so we, somehow we, we 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 this came up in our discussions, and uh, you know, it's just a happy, um, uh, really really nice nice way of um, talking about this. And I of course I acknowledge the, the that. Uh, uh, story about from my student. Um, the experience itself was um, was you know on, I think on on the one hand it was me uh, using the kind of material that all I always prefer uh, the kind of personal writing in my own research. I've always this 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 is the kind of favored uh, uh, sources I uh, in my in my own work you know in my uh, earlier books that you mentioned, uh, whether it's the power of the internet or the Red God Generation book. In the Red God Generation book, I use diaries and letters. In the power of the internet, in order to understand uh, the early history of the internet, I invited the uh, respondents. That's that was you know in in uh, very early on. I invited the respondents to write personal stories, basically internet autobiographies. And some of them wrote very long stories. I collected uh, dozens of those to use for my book. So that's kind of my preferred uh, um, material. I, you know, I read so many uh, Red God and former Sandan use uh, personal stories and writings. I just, uh, very often I, I spent too much time reading those stories because I was just into reading them and forget I was writing about them and forgot, uh, forgot that uh, you know, I was going to study them. I just, uh, like reading stories of these people. So that's, in, in that sense, I, I really, uh, I spend a lot of time collecting and reading all these stories. Um, but as you said, this was the same period, you know, beginning of March, we had we began to have our own lockdown. 
So I began to see that you know, I, I, I learned from their stories and I, I, I got inspiration from their stories. You know, a lot of them wrote about how I have to persevere, how I have to you know, fight to the end, you know, resilience and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very moving stories. It provided kind of um, um, motivation for me to navigate my own lockdown. One other thing uh, I would mention, and this I, I think uh, I, sh I shared it uh, in the middle of writing with a colleague, good colleague of mine. I said, you know, I, I never imagined I could write uh, this fast, but now I can understand why journalists can write long reports in a very short period of time. And they write better than social scientists, right? And now I understand why, because you are in the middle of things, you are deeply committed emotionally, full of energy and enthusiasm. And when you are, when you get to, you know, sit down to write about what's just still happening maybe online, you have that, you get that sense of energy. I, I felt energized to write. And uh, uh, of course, by the end of the summer, I was so exhausted. I was totally exhausted. I thought I definitely, I wasn't going to do this again. I felt like sick, you know, but the process itself was energizing. Uh, for me, and uh, uh, I, I began. It's, it's a different kind of writing experience, and uh, you know, in retrospect, I appreciated that, and um, appreciated that I had the time to do that. And um, of course, I was so grateful to all these uh, diarists who were writing every day in the middle of the lockdown during that kind of very difficult, uh, uh, you know time, right? Uh, very difficult. They had to worry about groceries and there's still some people that wrote about this. Uh, what, uh, they suddenly realized before it, they, were, they were so sleepy and tired in time to go to bed and suddenly realized they hadn't written today's story and they got to write it before they go to bed. That's, you know, what, what can I complain about my own writing, right? <laughs> so I learned a lot. I was, I was inspired by these stories. Well, thank you. Um, I've been very inspired by by hearing them, by reading your book. And again, uh, today we've been talking about Guo Binyang's excellent new book, The Wuhan Lockdown and the Limits of Critique. Thank you so much for coming to UVA and for delivering the Coffin Lecture this year.